Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Today's topic is a very classical topic about adjoint functors. Oh, sorry, I got it wrong about Frobenius reciprocity. So it's this back and forth process, which actually in the end, partially at least motivated the story of adjoint functors. Um, and here's the idea, and it's kind of a nice explanation how induction and restriction work together. So Frobenius reciprocity really explains how that works. So I think of two categories. If you don't know what a category is actually not so important, just think about two bubbles. One bubble is G rep and one bubble is H rep. And there are two ways. Well, there's a way to go from left to right and there's a way from, to go from right to left. One of them is restriction, one of them is induction. And well, if you look at this picture, you kind of could, well, imagine at least that there might be a relation between induction and restriction and this relation is exactly explained by uh, the so-called Frobenius reciprocity. Um, I will talk about adjoint functors later, but for now, really, we don't need to know any category theory. There's just two bubbles, two worlds, G rep and H rep, which I hope is a reasonable notation for G reps and H reps. And there's a way to go from left to right or from right to left. And G is a big group and H is a subgroup. Um, so let's have a look at, so hmm, how can you actually now come up with a conjecture of what is going on here? And this is what Frobenius did. So Frobenius basically did a lot of calculation with characters. Frobenius was a pioneer of characters. So Frobenius was, I think, really into characters. I'm also very into characters, but um, I'm just bad at it. And Frobenius was really good. Anyway, so basically here's the calculation. And the main example is kind of the regular representation again. There's zillions of other examples, and I will give you at least one more. And then we kind of have the abstract statement. But as I said, really how Frobenius came up with this. So this really goes back to Frobenius. And how Frobenius came up with this is just, just do zillions of calculations. And Frobenius was an expert doing calculations. In contrast to me, I would just feed the problem into a machine and see what the machine says. But Frobenius did this 120 years ago-ish. And it was quite hard to just ask a computer. Um, it wasn't impossible, so kind of versions of computers were around, but it was really, really hard in contrast to nowadays, where I just would use some magma or whatever, whatever works. There are so many ways to do that. Anyway, it was a huge raffle. I apologize. So let's go back to the regular representation. So the regular representation, I always like to think of it like the action of a groove on its scaling graph, so the action of a groove on itself. Uh, and there is a very natural subgroup of any group, or maybe not a very natural one, but there is a subgroup of any group. That's a trivia group. And the kind of the first induced representation would be to just induce, um, as it's done here, the trivial representation of the trivial group to H. And that's the regular representation. So the induction of the trivial representation to H is a regular representation. And you can ask how often, for example, the trivial character appears in this trivial representation. And as I tried to explain in previous videos, you just need to compute the inner product on those spaces. So the inner product on those characters. And it turns out that this is not so hard. So um, the trivial representation appears in the regular representation exactly once. Remember that every representation, every simple representation appears in the uh, regular representation as often as its dimension. And well, trivial representation is of dimension one. Okay, but you might, want to do a different calculation, you just shift over the, the int to the right hand side. Okay, so you can also look at the well trivial character inside of this guy, which is again the trivial character. So if your restriction is easy, right? So if you restrict to trivial representation to uh, any group, it's still trivial. Um, and of course, the trivial character appears in the trivial character once. So you also get one. And you have this nice um, way of kind of, you really want to know this number, there's an induction involved. Induction is a bit hard. And this number is way easier to compute, there's a restriction involved. And restriction is relatively easy and you go to a well, smaller subgroup. And this is the easy calculation that the chi one in chi one appears exactly once, corresponds to on the other side, to the not quite, an absolutely not trivial statement that the trivial representation, the not trivial statement that the trivial representation uh, bear with me. So the not obvious statement, the not obvious uh, proof in the end that the trivial representation appears exactly once in the regular representation is here under this nice analogy just related to 
at a trivial character who sees the trivial character exactly once. And I definitely should write run here and not zero. But anyway, uh, let's just write one uh, to, get, to get it correct. Forgive me. Um, so this is a pretty cool example. So you really want to know induction. You kind of shift it over to the easier problem of respection, and you can do the calculation there. And Fabinius did zillions of these calculations, and then you kind of would come up with the maybe with the conjecture yourself if you would have done a one million of those calculations. So Fabinius, and we will go there in a different video, but Fabinius was really into symmetric groups, which is kind of understandable, obviously, because well, well what is what are the most important non-commutative non groups? Probably the symmetric groups. Anyway, for the symmetric groups, induction and restriction are really, really beautiful. And it turns out um, that there's an extremely powerful idea, which I'm going to explain in a later video. But roughly, what you can do here is you have, uh, for each row, you have S0, S1, symmetric group Z Well, symmetric group 0 is a bit boring. But anyway, um, S1, S2, S3, S4, and so forth. And of course, the symmetric group N minus 1 sits in the symmetric group N. And you can use that to induce representations from n minus one to n. And turns out that the answer is really, really nice as already indicated by this picture, which I'm not going to explain in details uh, right now, but let's just look at a specific example, namely the example of trying to induce this representation. So all of these funny symbols here correspond to representations of the respective symmetric groups. So S2 has two simple ones, these two, and the arrows indicate how they induce. And that was already known to Frobenius, although the diagram you see here is not known as a Frobenius diagram, but rather as a Young diagram. So this um, visual explanation of induction and restriction followed a little bit later, but let's ignore that for now. So basically this was already known to Frobenius that for example, if you induce from S2 to S3, that's this step. Um, so the, definitely the, the index here is three, so you make everything three times as big. Um, turns out that S2 has only dimension one representations anyway. So your induced representation is always three dimensional and you can actually easily compute that the character of the induced representation, if you induce this one here, which stands for the trivial one. And let's say you check it with the trivial representation. Then this is, this is one. So this is here, the trivial. So if you induce up, you get a trivial and there's something else. Um, and you can check that this character is one. And actually it's again the same by just shifting here the uh, restriction to the other side. Restriction is of course of the trivial representation stays trivial. So here's the same formula as before, character of trivial in character of trivial, sure that appears once. It's again the same kind of formula, um, works here very nice, nice as well. But you've blown up the representation by three. So you started with one. So whatever you get on the next level should be of dimension three because of the index here. Um, but you only found one summand, the trivial representation. So there's another summand. And it turns out if you would do the calculation now for this one as well, you could check that there's a new summand turning up. And you just have constructed a new representation of S3, which is, of course, we know that's a standard representation, but you could have constructed them by just inducing representation from S2 to S3, which is the whole idea, right? You kind of want to start with a smaller group and you want to induce representations up. And this was already known to Verbenius, and it boils down to this funny calculation, which uh, since this slide is now a little bit messy, let's just go here. So you can always shift induction uh, and treat it for re restriction. You just need to shift it in the argument. So you can shift induction for restriction, which is really cool because usually restriction is easy and induction is not so, not so easy. And this is known as Frobenius reciprocity. And as I said, Frobenius basically came up with it by doing enough calculations. If you know what to prove, then it's not so hard to prove anymore, actually. And he has a more type of categorical type statement, if you like those. But if you like the character statement, it's really just what is the character of the induced representation? You can check that by looking at the character of the restricted representation. So here's the same game just for home spaces. Uh, you shift induction from uh, left to right over right to left depends a bit. And the setup is of course the same as before. We have a subgroup, we have an H representation, a G representation. Slight catch here, I'm kind of assuming that I'm working over the ground field C because I would like to have these guys here. Um, but anyway, I will explain uh, a more general picture in a second. And what is written here is really just that the, the two induction restrictions are Hamitian adjoints, right? There's a complex scalar product going on. 
and you can just shift one from one side to the other, e exactly like you would shift a matrix to the other side, but and then transpose it in a um, in a, a usual complex um, scalar product. So induction to restriction are kind of like transpose matrices to one another. Okay. So this Frobenius reciprocity, a really cool way to relate induction and restriction. Again, I said again, you kind of want to know induction and this tells you that you, you're good because you can do it by knowing restriction only, which is cool. Um, let's come back to our picture from before. So if you like this language, then actually what Frobenius reciprocity says is that those guys are an adjoint pair. Um, you can reformulate that slightly by realizing that induction that I described in the last video in a little bit of an ad hoc way, kind of I forced, well, it's not my description, but anyway, um, the description that I, that I gave is kind of forced the cor correct value on uh, the characters, if you want, on the representation of the remaining elements of G by using this idea of corsets. You can have a slightly more, well, elegant, less explicit description. So more elegant, less explicit. Mm. There is no free lunch, nah, sorry. But anyway, you can have a more elegant description if you want by realizing induction as a, tr uh, as a tensor product functor. And then this beast here is just really the Tom tensor adjunction, which is a very, very fundamental concept of modern mathematics. Also discovered way later than Frobenius reciprocity. So Frobenius really just did character calculations, which is fair enough. I mean, it was 120 years ago. This idea of tensor home adjunction is much newer. This idea of adjoint functors is much newer. And this is kind of always true because it's a tensor homo junction. So induction is always the left adjoint of restriction. And in my picture from before, so this is this is a green box. The green box kind of is always true. Uh, the red box really relies on that I'm using a finite groups and complex numbers because well, it's also it's also implied by Fabrini's reciprocity that induction is the right adjoint to restriction. But that's kind of a coincidence of the, a finite group miracle, another one. Usually there's a different functor called co-induction, uh, which is not quite induction, but in this case, they're just equivalent. Okay, so to clarify here this picture, green, kind of always true in, in, true in very huge generality. Red, kind of the converse, which just looks like you're transposing a matrix or something like that. It's not true in general. It's really a finite group miracle that it's true. But if you like, like me, like finite groups of other complex numbers, who doesn't like representations of finite groups of other complex numbers? I guess if you made it this far into this lecture series, uh, well, maybe not, but I hope at least you like uh, representations of finite groups of other complex numbers. Here's another one of those miracles that doesn't work in general. Anyway, this was a huge raffle. So the elegant, if you want, way of saying what induction and restriction are by a Frobenius reciprocity is that they're a natural pair. Uh, left adjoint and a right adjoint at the same time. Um, in more down to earth terms, it's really just saying that you can shift around characters. You can compute characters of induced representations using restriction, which is just way better because induction is a little bit of a, well, maybe not fishy, but a little bit of a complicated process anyway. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will talk to you next time.